Welcome back to the shop, everyone. I've got the Pilot TV 37 uh, back on the bench again. I had a little bit of a hiatus uh, working on this because I had to wait for my uh, parts order to come in. The owner of uh, Just Radios was out on vacation for a bit, so it wasn't until the 20th of October that I actually uh, had the parts shipped out. But all's good. I got them all here. And I was working on a radio for another club member in the interim, so I was dedicating all my effort to that, and um, which means I have about three weeks to get this done and working for the club, uh, the uh, the club contest. Uh, that being said, I've I haven't done a whole lot. I literally just spent the last hour or so just doing a few little things, mostly putting in the new six thousand volt deflection capacitors, and I did replace one additional. Resistor in here is a 3.9 mega ohm that goes to the vertical hold control, I believe, and that was drifting pretty badly. And there was also this uh, 1,000 volt rated cap right here. Swapped that out, and that's about it. I haven't dealt with the power supply section yet, mostly because I'm still trying to figure out how I want to deal with that one dual section cap. I consider drilling the rivets out and removing the whole thing, cutting the top off of it, stuffing the new caps inside of it and all that. The only problem with that is that the uh, this cap uses the twist style of lugs and one of them is not being used so I can easily twist that back to release it. The other though has been twisted over and soldered as a ground or a, uh, for the negative point and I don't know if I'd be able to get that one to go back through this wafer here. If I damage the wafer I'm in trouble because that's the insulator that keeps it isolated from the um, from the line voltage. And I really don't want to mess that up so I'm still weighing my options there but I know I had a raster prior to me going in here and messing around with all this stuff. What I want to see is now that I've done that work has anything changed? Have I made any, uh, have I caused any problems by digging around in there? So I'm going to break out the Variac and the isolation transformer, throw it on, and see if we still get some kind of an image. Okay, I jammed the knobs back on for the important controls, volume, brightness, and, uh, forget what the hell that one does, it's probably contrast. Go ahead and kill the lights, and oh, uh, before I do that, I did want to throw on my meter to the B plus reel, just for the heck of it. I'm curious. Let's see. What we get currently off of power supply, if anything. I mean, obviously we're going to get something. Oh, I see some flickering. Okay, we do have... Interesting, the brightness control doesn't really work all that well down at the bottom. Okay. Ooh. Okay, that's not good. Uh, the other thing that I'm noticing is that there appears to be an ion burn right in the middle of the CRT. So, that is kind of unfortunate. Now, one of these CRTs usually wouldn't do that unless they're, um, unless the, uh, CRT wasn't being swept. I mean... In, in, in one of these, from what I understand, because the uh, electrostatic deflection is used, the ions, the little bits of junk that are left behind inside the CRT when it's evacuated that don't get eaten up by the getter and basically any little piece of the cathode that, that uh, you know, eventually flakes off. All that gets shot at the speed of light towards the, uh, the, phosphor, the, the, the phosphor coating on the inside of here. When it slams into it, it damages that and it darkens over time. Normally on an electrostatic, the ions get pushed around by the electrostatic deflection plates, just like the electrons do. So technically, 
the screen should wear out fairly evenly however it's you know being swept um, but this one has a dead spot right in the center which would indicate that this thing had basically no deflection and the beam wasn't being focused so it was kind of spread out you know it's coming out in a sort of cone shape and it would just destroy the very center of that which I would expect to see in like an oscilloscope where they didn't have the sweep turned on like they, they just set it to external and didn't have anything hooked up to it so that's a uh, bit of a bummer but I mean it doesn't mean it's not still watchable it just means that if there's anything happening in the center of the screen you're probably not going to see it probably makes football a little unenjoyable but that being said, we did get a little more brightness, but I'm still getting something in here is arcing. And I didn't, unfortunately, I wasn't looking underneath the chassis, so I couldn't see if it was underneath there. Um, and I could hear it, and it was very un unpleasant. So either we've got arcing inside of a tube, um, or potentially one of the electrolytics is exceptionally leaky and I'm actually getting punched through through the, uh, the dielectric. So, good news is I didn't uh, do any worse than when I started. Still have deflection. It looked a bit brighter than before, so that's great. Uh, which means I just need to go through the power supply section and then finish off the other half of the chassis. And also turn the variac off. So, what do we really have left to deal with? Well, like I said, for starters, that capacitor, that capacitor, and those two. I did have this one very low value 5 microfarad disconnected because I was... I needed to move this out of the way to get to this area to work on it. Uh, but outside of those up there, the only other capacitors that I still have to deal with are the wax guys down here. We've got uh, that one. Again, I'm replacing it just because I don't like the way it was installed, and that most of these weren't even the right values anyway, so I want to get that back to close to factory spec. Uh, we had this guy. That guy's a one, two, three, four, five, six remaining paper caps. That should be a snap to do. And then, yeah, then those up there. Uh, the other thing that I am planning on doing, if I have them over here, is I want to install a fuse block. So I have one of those, and I'd kind of like to mount it on the side of the inside of the chassis because the line enters right there, and I was going to see if I can't pull it over the chassis, hook it to that, and come back. See how that works. And if I can get this bag open. There we go. I'm meaning to buy some of these, but I just never really... I, I don't make orders to Mauser very often. I have these wonderful CL90 inrush current limiters. So these are... What are they listed as? Like 200 ohms cold and then they drop to about three when warm so this will provide a little bit more resistance to the filament string on startup and it'll it'll warm up a lot slower instead of smacking all the the filaments at once especially on the uh, the crt now one thing i've seen some people do with the crt to try and protect the filament from inrush current is to add an isolation transformer they just sort of tuck a little 115 volt to 6.3 volt AC transformer and then they take this CRT filament out of the rest of the string and then presumably put a uh, equivalent resistor back in there to uh, take up the load from it being absent. Um, I don't really want to make any sort of s modifications like that to this set. It's not going to get turned on a lot. And I think the CL90 here should do uh, just fine for that matter. I figure we'll probably just take this one lead here off the switch and we'll extend it, bring it back. There's a hole right here for a number six screw. Unfortunately, this resistor's in the way. I don't really want to drill any screw, uh, any holes in this chassis, but I might 
put just one to get this far enough up that it's not near that and then I can run the wire over and run it back and it'll be clear of everything so that's the plan there and then yeah finish off this side deal with that power supply Well, it's a new day, and I have pretty much wrapped up all the major recapping work. Uh, let me just make sure to make a fool of myself. Yeah, I think that's everything. Uh, I went and did all of the paper caps over in this area. Those are all dealt with. And I got off my butt, and I rebuilt the power supply area over here. So let me actually bring that over so it's a little easier to see. So this set has a negative and a positive power supply. The positive power supply is handled by a 25Z6, this octal base tube right here. And then the negative power supply is handled by a 35W4, which is this ceramic uh, miniature socket over here with this great big 20 ohm resistor coming off of it. Uh, so for the negative power supply, we have two individual electrolytics. I'm not quite sure why they went that route. Um, oh, they, they did that because the negatives are actually joined by a 470 ohm resistor, so they couldn't be in the same can. Okay, that, that makes more sense. But uh, these two are insulated from the chassis because the positive legs of these are supposed to go to ground, so this one's tied to here. This one's supposed to be an 80 microfarad, and this one's supposed to be a 40. Um, I have a lot of sets that use 100 microfarad caps, and this one already used one, so I just bought some 100s and stuck a 100 in there. That should be alright. It's got a 47 to replace the 40, and I simply bent the uh, center lug over so it's out of the way. And replacing those is easy because these has at least three lugs on there to attach the ground side to, and the positive leg on each of these only went to one point. This one goes directly to ground here. This one goes directly to ground here using one of the lugs on the dual section electrolytic for the positive supply. So the positive supply one uses a 100 microfarad and a 40 microfarad. Uh, the 40 is the one that comes straight off the rectifier tube so it doesn't overload it. And then the other guy here would ordinarily, the, these two would be coupled together using the speaker field. Well, since the speaker got swapped out for a permanent magnet, they stuck a 200 ohm 10 watt resistor on the top side of the chassis and ran wires to bridge the two sides. I'm leaving that in place because I don't have a better solution. And I thought about trying to move that resistor down here, but it's already kind of crowded and it's gonna generate heat. I don't know how much yet because I haven't been able to power this up for a long period of time. I do wanna take a look and see how much voltage drop it's got across it. But, um, I nixed the idea of removing this cap, cutting it open, and restuffing it, because honestly, I just couldn't get to it. Uh, if I drill, like I said earlier, if I drilled those uh, rivets out, trying to untwist these lugs here to get the thing to pop out of there would have been a pain. Turns out this isn't really an insulating uh, wafer. The can is electrically grounded to chassis, so that wouldn't have been a problem. But it just would have been a pain, and just trying to get it in there was annoying. But I realized the... Uh, this section of the chassis that contains the tuner is actually a sub-chassis attached with sheet metal screws, and there are four of them on either side here, one of which is right there. And uh, I just popped the screw out from the top, grabbed a terminal strip from my bin, and sunk that screw right back into its original position from the bottom, and this gave me a perfect attachment point for the two new electrolytics. Uh, ran a new ground wire from the pair of them to the original can, and then simply took all the original wiring and resistors and moved them right to the new lugs. Didn't have to make any new connections, just unhooked them, scooted them over, and resoldered them, and done. Very easy. Uh, did, it did poke around and make sure there weren't any areas that might have potential shorts, because I'm still trying to tack down, track down that... Uh, that arcing, which is what which is what I want to look for now. I'm gonna flip this back over, we're gonna get it powered up, and I wanna see if it's still happening, if I can locate it, if it's not down here that I can see, flip over back on the top and see if I can find arcing in any one of the tubes. Again, I haven't tested any of the tubes. Uh, and unless something is really, really wrong with the set, I try to leave them alone. But I uh, I will test them this time just to see if I have any heater to cathode shorts or anything that could be causing problems. 
So let me get this reoriented and then we'll fire it up. Okay, I think I got the CRT in shot there. Turn the brightness up so I don't have to worry about that. Uh, I've got my meter on the B plus line coming off the 100 microfarad cap. That's the direct output to the rest of the system. So I'm gonna go dim the lights and then we will gently power this up again and see what we get. Uh, that actually might be enough. I don't need to turn off my other light. It's a little difficult to see the meter then. Okay, there's our raster. Looks rectangular. More so than the last time I tried this. You can see we still have that dead spot. What I'm noticing though is I'm not yet getting arcing. So that's a bonus. But yeah, we don't get any brightness control but halfway up and then we get some. Contrast control, nothing really. But so far, no arcing. So that's good. We're going to gently bring it up some more because we're barely at 100 volts B plus. Okay. 105. Yeah, it's pretty nicely following the AC input voltage. Obviously that's not where it ought to be. But, okay, it's not bad, but the controls are all out of order. But yeah, arcing seems to be gone. Let's try very gently bringing it up to a full line voltage here. I'm not getting any pops or crackles out of the speaker. I can hear it on the volume control, so that's nice. Try right, minimum phosphor there. And that is full line voltage right there. Speaker apparently sucks down quite a bit. If I crank the volume all the way up, it drops the B plus to 100 volts, but if I turn it down, it goes back up to about line voltage DC, about 120 volts DC. But, it looks like, well, maybe they're... I might just be seeing a, uh, a slight defect in the center of the screen, not so much a dead spot. It may have been an overreaction. But yeah. Uh, okay. In that case, the next thing I want to do is uh, I need to break out my pattern generator. I have a Heath kit that ought to work A-OK -okay for this. And uh, I want to get a signal hooked up to it, and I want to see if we can't get RF to go through the chassis. And if we can, which would be phenomenal, let's see about cranking the adjustments. Now, I do still need to make a replacement piece of phenolic for, I believe, the vertical size control that last one is vertical size and vertical centering uh, no that's the vertical centering control that doesn't have a wafer so I gotta be careful with that one but the arcing must have been in one, either one of the remaining paper caps on the side over here or um, one thing I hadn't considered at the time, it may have been the crappy wire running from the power resistor on the top of the chassis to the electrolytics on the bottom. I replaced that with new wire, uh, smaller insulation, and it just takes up less room. Insulation's rated for it. But, I need to clean the bench off, bust out my gear, and I'll meet you back here in a minute. Okay. I've got the set hooked up to the Heath kit. I've actually got the brightness turned all the way down to save on the picture tube. And uh, yeah, we turn this up. 
there we are. There is our crosshatch pattern. Uh, I can also do uh, horizontal and vertical bars with the Heath kit. Super handy little cheap piece of equipment I picked up. Of course, it's also designed for color sets, and all the color stuff is kind of uh, that's useless on this, so I don't really worry about it. However, there are a few things I noticed. Uh, well, first of all, the channel selection on the Heath kit is variable rather than fixed channel outputs, so I can kind of fiddle it around. I'm, cer I'm currently using channel 4, or at least I'm using channel 4 according to the Heath kit, and then I'm using whatever's close on here. Seems like I'm probably just a bit above 4, closer to 5, uh, as far as the pilot is concerned, on the lower scale, mind you. Um, yeah, there seems to be a pretty big stretch between 4 and 5. Uh, one of the things I noticed is the contrast control royally screws up the raster. I don't know what's up with that. Um, if I leave it kind of in the middle, it seems to be fine. It's possible this just this control just needs to be cleaned. I swear I cleaned all of these, but I'll, I'll clean it again. Other thing I noticed is that I mentioned that the B plus drops by about 20 volts. If I crank the volume control up all the way, apparently the deflection circuits do not like that. Or some other part of the system is not particularly fond of that. Granted, I am driving it with... Uh, with a, bot, a dot and bar generator, so maybe when I have a regular video source plugged in, it'll be more happy. Now, earlier I did mention that it seemed like the middle was a little dimmer than the rest of it. Maybe there was some damage there. It does still look like the very center of the CRT is still just a little bit dimmer, but the rest of it is still giving me a pretty good image, and this is just barely turned up. Full brightness, don't need to use it. It seems to be quite happy below that. Uh, and I, I do still have some artifacting and some other little issues. Uh, I'm going to go through these. It has a set of instructions about how to align all this. The one thing that threw me for a loop, though, is that the Pilot TV37 does not have an external vertical linearity control. Uh, the horizontal size and horizontal linearity are actually only accessible through the top of the chassis alongside the CRT neck. Well, that's, that's funny. So, if I have a magnetic or a ferrous object and I move it around where the uh, deflection plates are in the CRT, you can actually see it. Uh... Yeah, that's kind of cool. Anyway, so those controls are there. The rest of the ones are on the back, but the vertical linearity, there is no potentiometer for that. It's actually fixed. And according to the instructions, the original early design had a resistor, I think, what they, I think Sam's calls that as R59A, and originally it was supposed to be, what, 1.2 mega ohms, and then they say if that doesn't look right, you swap it out for a different value, I think was their instructions, which I thought was kind of an unusual choice. I, I don't think I've ever seen another set with a fixed vertical linearity because, I mean, really, why would you want it to be fixed? You want to be able to adjust it. It seemed a little, just a little counterintuitive. Um, but yeah, that's, at least, that's what it states for the early models. Now, it states for later models that there is some other sort of circuit that handles the vertical linearity and does not require you to mess with the resistors. Uh, this may be one of those, and I did technically put R59A or B back. I used the schematic as a reference, saw that it was missing, and uh, yeah, so R59B on the SAMS photo fact is a 5.6 mega ohm resistor between, let's see, the vertical amplifier uh, plate and the plate of the vertical multi. Uh, the vertical multivibrator, or at least uh, one half of it. It is possible that by including that resistor where it was not in this chassis that I am screwing up the vertical linearity. Maybe, maybe there's an automatic linearity control built into it or something like that. I've never seen that before. I haven't 
worked on enough of these early televisions because all the ones I have have an external vertical vertical linearity control, so it's a little a little different. But all the other controls do work. Uh, I have an insulated screwdriver I've been using to gently touch those, although the trimmers that are inside the chassis, I only have metallic screwdrivers to work with to actually get them to rotate. I don't have anything that's strong enough to rotate them that's non-conductive. But it is nice to see that we have good horizontal and vertical hold. The, the, uh, the image is stable, of course I am cranking the RF output, so it should have something to lock to for crying out loud. But again, uh, the B plus dip when this is cranked up is a little concerning. And the contrast control being buggy is kind of annoying, but I mean, if you only have to set the contrast control at one point to watch it, whoop de doo I guess. I do have another Heath kit that is designed to send uh, alignment signals, but it unfortunately is for the later, the, the later standardized uh, intermediate frequency and um, coil signals that are like in the 40 to 50 megahertz range. This thing is one of the earlier sets that's got, you know, 20 kilohertz or 20 megahertz-ish range, like 22 megahertz range, intermediate frequency and coil peaking, whatnot. And I do technically have a generator capable of providing those signals, but I haven't worked on it, so I don't actually know if it's accurate. So for right now, I'm going to leave that alone, and I'm going to find a different video signal, probably my VCR, get that hooked up, and see if we get a watchable image. Okay, I've got the VCR hooked up. I'm going to hit play. I have no idea where we are in terms of output. Ah, okay, that's it right there. All right, so there's our video signal, but it doesn't look particularly happy. Trying to see where it's the most stable. Right now, stable is not what I would call any of this. So we're going to stop rewinding. We'll just let it play. Just being nostalgic, nostalgic about the 1960s or whatever. A lot of people who really did not grow up with the VW Beetle fell in love with this car. Again, because it has all the wonderful attributes that the original... V Okay, so audio's coming through good. The video signal is a little unhappy. Great curves and shape and proportion to it. So you can see yourself driving in that car and having people look at you and being proud of owning a car like that. The story of Volkswagen is falling. Huh. The contrast control is actively having an effect on the signal. If I crank it down too far, I actually lose I lose the signal, which is weird. Hmm. Alright, well that seems to work fine, but it's this business that I'm not too happy with, and I'm not quite sure what's causing that. Um, I'm not using actual twin lead for one thing. I just have a pair of alligator clips running from the uh, Balin on the back of the VCR to the antenna terminal connections. So it's probably a little glitchy because of that. But the, um, the fact that I have to use the contrast control to even have a chance of getting a stable watchable image is, is really weird. The European. Uh, okay, so I did a little bit of research, puttered around on the forums, and I found a really detailed write-up about the uh, restoration of one on Radio Museum. Tons of uh, notes on the schematics and all sorts of different things. So as far as the vertical linearity goes, the resistor that I put in is a default value for the later chassis revision that uses uh, doesn't use a, a um, some sort of a network with some ceramic disc capacitors. The earlier ones did. This chassis did not have that. So the one I put in there is okay. Apparently if you wanted to actually adjust the linearity, you would have to fiddle with that uh, resistor value 
until you're happy with it. As far as I can tell, the vertical linearity right now seems to be fine. What I discovered, though, while reading that, is that the contrast control is actually extremely important to the TV37's operation because it's actually controlling the gain on the uh, the video strip, apparently. It's, it's I can't remember, I think it's uh, actually part of the plate circuit for the, uh, for the video strip, which is unusual, which means that if I crank it all the way down, we're going to actually lose the signal, we're going to lose sync, uh, because all those tubes are, of course, responsible for actually amplifying the incoming signal before it gets to the sync separator. So that's a little different. Um, so it, it's a very dependent, once you tweak and get the... Uh, get the signal locked in where you wanted, then apparently the trick is you just dial in the, the brightness and contrast control until you have a stable image. I am still noticing some issues, the flickering, see how the top of the image is kind of tweaking over on one side. As, as, it, as it warms up occasionally, you'll get a little bit of waviness in it. Again, I haven't done an alignment or anything on it. I just sort of left it be, but I did clean the contrast control and that seems to have made the biggest difference. Um, it, it just seems to have uh, created a much more stable image. And of course, this image, I think, is smaller than the shadow mask actually allows. Yeah. So, uh, eventually, I'll wind up blowing this out. And if there is any artifacting on the, the top or the, or the very sides, the mask will probably chop all that off. So, uh, yeah. Thus far, I think this is pretty good. So I'll have to, I'll have to finish up by putting in the safety features, fuse and seal 90 on the filament string, on the power supply side of things, and then well, I can't really do an IF alignment because the generator that I have um, is unrestored. I do have a Heathkit TV alignment generator, but I am unsure of the accuracy of its output. The other signal generator that I have, I think is a, it's a precision brand unit. It's a model 200, E200C, and it covers a much wider spectrum, and I'd really like to get it up and running. But uh, for now, I think this will work just fine for taking it into the uh, competition. So I'm going to leave it as is. For the moment, we'll have to get the bottom mounted back on it and everything, put it back in the cabinet, and then I can set uh, the image up to fit the shadow mask, and then we'll see how it goes from there. Uh, but for now, I appreciate you showing back up and taking a look around at things, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.